Welcome back to Questing Beast, I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at the Black Worm of Brandonsford. So this was an adventure that came out in PDF form a while back and got a lot of rave reviews from people who read it, and I was very excited to take a look at it. Uh, it just came out in print-on-demand form. Uh, link will be down in the description below. And uh, he sent it over to me to take a look at it. It is by Chance Dudenak. And on the back here, it says, There is a dragon in the woods. Those friendly dwarves were the first to go, the poor things. And now the beast has been killing and eating the people of Brandon's Ford. No one wants to leave the town's walls. With the humans out of the forest, fairies have taken over. And now the, uh, the goblin king, Hogboon, seeks to claim the entire forest as his new kingdom. It's old school compatible for levels one through three. Uh, visit the colorful inhabitants of Brandon's Ford. Adventure through a fairy haunted woods outside the town. Delve into two dungeon locations and hopefully slay a dragon. Um, so you know I'm going to love this because it is a dragon slaying adventure for level one characters. And there's just not enough of those. Um, as I'm always saying, Dungeons and Dragons needs more dungeons and especially more dragons. So I'm glad to see that this has it in there. It is, let's see how many pages... 18, 19 pages long, really only 17 if you don't include the license at the back of it. Um, and it's going to be compatible for pretty much any old school type adventure. Before we dig into it though, quick shout out to today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Into the AM and their series of fantasy and sci-fi themed t-shirts. If you're a game master and you're looking for a cool shirt to wear, the one that I'm wearing right now is one of my favorites. Right now over on their store, they have a Black Friday sale going on, where until Friday, the whole store is between 30 and 80% off. And then starting on Saturday, the store is from 40 to 90% off. If you use the link down in the description below, you get an additional 10% off. So if you're looking for a cool t-shirt to wear, this is the time to go check it out. Thanks again to Into the AM for sponsoring. Now let's get back to the show. All right, let's take a look inside here. Nice cover page. Uh, the design here reminds me a lot of the work that we've seen in books like uh, Wormskin, which is the zine that covers Dolmenwood. In fact, this adventure I think would fit really well into Dolmenwood. And I love to see that because it's one of my favorite settings. I love the use of the uh, public domain artwork. Uh, the print quality is you know, about what you would expect for drive through RPG print on demand. The paper quality is not that great. It's a little bit see-through, as you can kind of see right over there. Um, and it's not staple bound. It's like glue bound, but it's not really that big of a deal. It's only 17 pages long and it stays open quite well. And it's very easy to read. Uh, the layout is really nice. It looks like it's all done in Allegrea, I would guess, possibly. Um, and it has a lot of bullet points to really pull out the important stuff. I found it very easy to read and very easy to understand. Uh, we have a map of our location right here. So I like how this isn't just a dungeon adventure for level ones. It's a overworld adventure. So you're going to get some experience uh, visiting cities and talking to people. You're going to have some experience doing dungeon delves and traveling across country from location to location. So it kind of has all of the stuff that you're going to need to get players into what old school D&D is like. Sounds like a really great starting point. It reminds me a little bit of um, a book that I did recently called In the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe. I reviewed that recently and it had a similar vibe. This is a bit smaller though. So we start off by just doing a general introduction with a DM background. Um, there is a dragon on the loose here. One of the secrets that the players will uncover is that the dragon is in fact one of the two dwarves that were eaten. I really like that idea that um, one of the dwarves or both of the dwarves really found a gold supply deep under a mountain and his greed for it drove him crazy and he killed his brother to take all the gold for himself and the sheer evil of this crime has transformed him into a dragon i love that concept for monsters where monsters aren't just weird unnatural aberrations they're the consequence of evil or some sort of grievous sin or something wrong that has gone um, terribly bad in the environment and that's transformed creatures into monsters um, it's very mythological in that sense a general overview of what's going on here. Some rumors, some so some stuff like uh, you think a, a dragon is bad. I heard that there's a man-eating giant in those woods. Happens to be true. Or the town's alchemist cavorts with an evil witch who lives deep in the forest. Partially true. We have a scale here of one inch to half a mile. Might have been a little bit easier if there was an actual hex crawl on here, uh, but it's really not that big of a deal. You can easily just use a ruler or estimate about how far things are using whatever hex crawling procedure you happen to have. Start off by looking at the town itself of Brandon's Ford with some of the main people that we can talk to, like Bentley, owner of the Clumsy Fox Tavern, Quinn, owner of the Golden Egg Tavern, rival taverns, that's always good, some inherent conflict, uh, a whole bunch of different NPCs you can possibly recruit, 
lawful fighters, uh, wizards, a thief, and a halfling, all of which have some basic stats. They have good punchy descriptions. So for example, the halfling is a shifty eyes, dirty mop of hair, wants to get his big break and never work again in his life, tends to hang back and pepper foes with his sling, enough that you can run them quite easily. Um, a, lo a lot of these characters have a problem of some sort or like a little quest that you can do. Nothing that's going to take up a whole session, but just enough that players are going to feel very satisfied if they investigate and figure out what's going on. So a really good example here is that we have this smith who's very superstitious, and he's kind of freaked out because it looks like he's being haunted by some sort of fey creature. Some sort of weird shadowy figure is appearing in his windows at night and leaving these mysterious trinkets around his house. A very small amount of investigation reveals that it's actually Ingrid the alchemist who has a crush on him and is leaving him love notes. Unfortunately, Warwick is illiterate, so he literally can't read any of them. Um, but you as the players can quickly solve that and possibly get them together or maybe blackmail them. One of the um, two inns is missing booze every night. It's, going, uh, it's disappearing, so you can investigate that and figure out what's going on. Turns out it's a leprechaun-like creature who may actually lead you to his pot of gold if you let him go. If you venture down into the woods, then you're going to have these random encounters, and they range anywhere from a golden fox to some fey hounds that might be hunting the fox, all the way up through the dragon. Um, I think it's a great idea to have, in any low-level adventure, to have at least one monster, a dragon, or something else that is way over the player's heads, and they're going to have to get very clever if they're going to deal with it. They can't just charge in and attack it, it's just going to eat them. Um, but a smart party can take out almost any creature of any size if they really put their minds to it and they think outside the box. The dragon itself right here, it has um, an AC of 18, it has eight hit die, it does three attacks, and it has a breath weapon that can do up to 32 damage because it does its hit points in damage of basically like a sulfurous gas. Its jaws are dripping with poison. It's horrible. Don't fight it. There are clues later on, though, about ways that you could possibly defeat it, especially uh, attacking in its eyes and its mouth. And there's a magic sword as well. You can go visit the Witch of the Woods. There is a giant here, a full-on man-eating giant, and you can rescue uh, one of the humans that he's captured and is about to eat. Um, of course, that, will, that person will tend to be very loud and possibly wake up the giant, and you'll have to flee from him. Love having to fight a giant. Brother Dirk has been captured there. Uh, a destroyed cavern, a dwarf's mine, uh, go into the dragon's lair itself. There's a ton of treasure in there, you know, more than enough to start leveling or get uh, a small party leveled up pretty quickly. Uh, 9,000 gold coins, earrings, garnets, skulls with ruby eyes, lots of nice classic treasure. A goblin castle, some of these are actually little dungeon crawls, as we will see later on. Uh, so the Goblin Castle here is actually, you can start seeing the different rooms are labeled. And it uses a system a little bit similar to what I did in The Waking of Willoughby Hall, where each major location has a little arrow uh, just to point to the important stuff there with some bolding. And then if you investigate, if you get closer to it, then there is an indent and you get to see what's there. So that easily uh, distinguishes the stuff that's obvious from the stuff that is a little bit more secret. So that's really useful for the game master, so they know what to tell the players and what to hold back on. You can meet the Goblin King and uh, possibly get his ring. As, a, as is mentioned later on here, if you actually kill the Goblin Ring and put on his ring, then you become the Goblin King. Uh, I love that, again, just as a way to give players way more power, or way more influence at least, than they were expecting at level 1. There's no reason why to, you should hang back on all of those things until they're a high level. Give players big rewards for doing cool stuff, even early on. It's not a big deal, because the world will naturally balance stuff out. If you become a Goblin King, then the other Goblin tribes might come after you. You're going to build rivals in the region. All sorts of new adventure op opportunities are going to present themselves. So never worry that you're overpowering the players. The world balances itself. But just give them cool stuff. Let them feel excited about accomplishing things. Uh, we have the Barrow Mound here. Let me skip over to the maps. So we have the little goblin castle here, uh, where the goblin king is hanging out, and then a barrow mound with level one and level two. A uh, good amount of jaquaying in, in terms of there being a, lots of different loops, right? Secret passage here, lots of different ways you can explore here. You can go through this way, you can go through that way. So players get a real sense of exploration. 
Uh, a lot of the rooms have a lot of interesting little puzzles in them. For example, there is four statues over here in this room that are just labeled valor, piety, wisdom, and duty with a, a figure that represents that. And then later on in the dungeon, you might come across a door where you have to answer a riddle being like, what are the virtues of a knight? And that's all it tells you. But if you've been paying attention to these statues, you probably know that it's those four virtues and you can open the door. Um, I love having little problems to solve. As I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be super hard, but as long as players have to think a little bit to get past, then they're engaged with the setting. And this does a really great job of that. I'm um, giving them just enough that they feel engaged and they feel like they're solving things. We have things like the a bunch of different crypts of different knights that are down here. Crypt of Sir Wilt, peeling murals on the walls depict a tranquil green forest. The sarcophagus is carved to look like a solemn human face with a long beard. Next to the sarcophagus is a table holding assortment of grimy bottles. So bottles might be things like potions of, he of healing, green, syrupy, and minty. I love that it tells you what it actually tastes like. A potion of sleep, purple, shimmering, and numbing. And one potion of tranquility, yellow, soothing fumes. When drunk, uh, save to or become completely relaxed, unable to perform physically demanding tasks. I love that. It doesn't make you weak. It just makes you languid and bored. Like you're just, not, you're just too bored to do anything. Uh, really great stuff. Um, most of the descriptions are, they don't go on forever. They just give you just enough that you get a vivid picture in your head, right? Like stuff like the, um, a solemn human face with a long beard carved on the sarcophagus. That's just enough that players feel immersed. Um, the maps are quite easy to read. As I often complain about on these maps, it would be nice if they were labeled with the actual name of the room so that you could look over this and get a sense of what everything was. Um, not a huge deal, though. I would probably print this out and, and have it next to you while you flip through this. You don't have to go back and forth. But uh, pretty easy to read. And we have some magic items at the back here, um, including the Emerald, God, Emerald Ring of the Goblin King that can turn you into a Goblin King. Uh, stuff like the Firelight Citrine, a glassy orange stone the size of an egg and warm to the touch. Produces light as a torch when shaken. If exposed to an open flame, causes a violent explosion. Right, so that's a great magic item because there's more than one use. It's like an ever-burning lamp, and it's a grenade. Or what's another good one here? Uh, how about the Silver Axe of Sir Wilt? A bearded axe made entirely of polished silver. Leafy vines are embossed across the shaft. This axe cannot harm inert material like stone, wood, or metal, but cleaves through flesh and bone like butter, able to effort effortlessly slice off limbs upon making contact. So it doesn't really give you rules on how that would work in play, but you could do stuff like if it actually hits, you don't even roll for damage, just pick a limb to remove and it just gets lopped off. And then maybe it just takes off like a quarter of their hit points or something like that. Really, really great because it adds flavor and it adds strategy. Um, this game, even though it's not too long, does packs a lot into a very small amount of space. It has lots of great NPCs that can interact with each other and that are easy to visualize. It has lots of different locations with little things to explore. And it has lots of opportunities for players to really get crazy and combine magic items with their circumstances and accomplish things that a normally a level one player couldn't. Um, so this is really well put together and it looks like a lot of fun. If you were running any kind of um, Dolmenwood or fantasy mythic forest like setting, this would be really nice to slot in there. Even if you didn't use the whole thing, you could easily grab some of those different locations and speckle them around your setting just to add uh, some more material there for players to explore. Um, as usual, I'll put links down in the description below for where you can get this in PDF or in print form. And uh, thank you for watching. See you guys next time.